It's always a great privilege to be here and to share the Word of God with you. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. You know, how shall we live in a world such as ours? What is our position, our place in this earth now? You know, we all know that this world is increasingly set against our belief. We all know that there is corruption. We know that nations are preparing for war. We understand that things are not getting better. So how then shall we behave as believers living in this planet? You know, the section we're looking at today in Jeremiah contains a wealth of advices. It will give us our position in relation to the future. The near future and up to the latter days, it will prepare us to handle the many changes that are now occurring and will occur. From the smallest alternation to the most severe, this section is our EPS, not GPS, our global positioning system, but our eternal position, positioning system. You know, the Bible in its entirety is our EPS. It is truly a handbook on life. It will show us how to get peace of mind in times of great turmoil, how to get the proper perspective in any given circumstances. It is not only a book on survival, it is also a book on fine living, spiritually, emotionally fine living. When one gets hold of God's advice in there, when one begins to see things as God sees them, life should improve tremendously. It is the best therapy against worries, against guilt trips, and it sets us on the right path. And for the occasion here in Jeremiah, these advices were given at the most difficult time in the history of Israel. It was at a time when not only did the people lose all that they had, not only were they taken captive in a foreign land, but their faith and hope were shattered since all seemed to indicate that their God was gone. Or perhaps that he was never there. The Israelites, glorious history with King David, all the promises given to him, promises of a great future in a magnificent land, promises of peace, all this came to an abrupt stop. The history of King Solomon, who had the admiration of the people of the world because of his great wisdom and riches, also came to a sudden end. However, it is right at this moment where God comes with such force, such gracious force, and speaks great words of counsel and comfort, words that tell us that it matters not what really happens around us because he is in full control. Words that bid us to look at him first and to find our answers in him and his word. And of course, the guidance we're about to see in this text is not only given to the Israelites. They were given to all believers from all dispensations. It speaks directly to our heart. As the Spirit of God testifies in Romans 1, that is Romans 15, 4. He says, whatsoever things were written in the past, such as the things that we're going to see in Jeremiah were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have what? Hope. Hope. It is the same hope that we find in our portion of the Scriptures today. So where are we in the book of Jeremiah? Here God instructs the prophet to write a letter to the people that were taken captive in Babylon. And there he tells them how to live in a foreign land. This is a letter to those who are in the diaspora, that is, in the dispersion as we are if we believe in the Messiah, since we are away from home. It is a letter to all believers who are also waiting for that day when they will be home with the Lord. So let us begin by reading the first seven verses. Some of the things written here might surprise many. So Jeremiah 29 it says, Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from, Jer from Jerusalem to the reminder of the elders who were carried away captive to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This happened after Jeconiah the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princess of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, the smith, and had departed from Jerusalem. So the letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who are carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. As the people were in captivity, the first thing that God establishes in his letter is his sovereignty. Well, in the first verse, we read that it is Nebuchadnezzar who carried away the captives. God corrects this in verse 4 and he adds, whom I have caused to be carried away. Nebuchadnezzar may have thought that he was the most blessed man in the world. Little did he know that he only played such a minute part in the whole history of redemption. That is the first lesson for us who are away from home. God is in complete control. Nothing escapes his attention and he directs all things according to his will. We may not always understand this, but this is the truth we must apply in such situations. And whatever his actions are, we are assured that he takes them in accordance to our welfare, to our eventual welfare. Because we are told that he constantly thinks of ways he can bless us. Amid the conditions, wars, tragedies, he prepares all circumstances so that he eventually blesses the believer. This is what he wants to do. And this is what he says in verse 11. He says, I know... The thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. It did not look like at this time, at the time of Jeremiah. But this is what God was preparing for them and he's preparing for us a great future. Because ultimately, his will be done. And his will is that we'll spend eternity with him, of course, if you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Well, I want to tell you that really should be enough for today. Because just this one truth is enough for us to meditate for months to come. But our God is very generous. There's much more for us in there. You know, the next thing he tells the Israelites, something that perhaps they did not expect, is to bless the place they were brought captive to and to bless the people there, to bless Babylon and to bless Babylonians. How could he ask them to do such a thing in light of what was happening? Did not the Babylonians kill members of their families? Maybe perhaps one father's, one's brother. Did not the Jewish society was destroyed? Wasn't it destroyed? Now they are told to pray for those who destroyed their society. You know, I want to tell you this is very precious and important what we're learning here. See what he tells them in verse 5. He tells them to build and dwell, to plant and eat, where? In enemy's territory. And what about us today? We are definitely not in the same predicament. Our country is far from being the Babylon of Jeremiah. So how much more is this speaking to us? This second point shows us that we have to partake in the growth of the place we live in. We are not called to be hermits or rebel. While we are not in this world, we are called to build, we are called to plant, to be among them and participate in the cities, in the placed prosperity. This is where our place of blessing is. This is where the Lord will bless us. And this is one area many believers and Israelites throughout history have succeeded. Wherever the blessings of the Bible or the Judeo-Christian religion was established, there was progress. We have previously noticed that scientific progress occurred where the Bible was believed. That humanitarian societies such as hospitals, orphanages, even soup kitchens were established under the Judeo-Christian religion. Look at our world today. The others are still back at the time where their religion was established. Progress, when they accept it, is important from the countries where the scriptures was at the base of their creation. This is not a matter of intelligence, not a matter of race. It is a matter of going back to the God of the Bible who makes no distinction between men. 
but who is ready to bless and bless as much as he can, as we can take, if we follow, of course, his precepts. And for the Israelites, wherever they went throughout history, they also blessed the countries where they lived. While many today are blaming the, the Israelites for the problems of the world's history, past and present, says otherwise. Consider that while well, the Jews are only 15 million people, that is less than half a percent of the world population. They, for instance, represent 22% of all the Nobel Prize winners from 1901 till 2010. Is this normal to you? And besides the Nobel Prizes, there are other similar prizes in the world that speak loudly of their contribution to the places they went and blessed. The Kyoto Prize, which is an international award to honor those who have contributed significantly to the scientific, cultural, and spiritual betterment of humankind, 25% of the winners are Jews. The World Foundation Prize, which seeks to reward those outstanding scientists and artists, 33% of the winners are Jews. The U.S. National Medal of Science is an honor bestowed by the President of the United States to individuals in science, engineering, and so on. 38% of the recipients are Jews. Why this anomaly? The answer may be found right here in our text. Many of the believers of the scriptures, as many in the Jewish population, they throughout history followed the word we find in Jeremiah, chapter 29, 5. Five, built and plant. And in verse 7 where it says, Seek the peace of the city where you have caused, have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. Not all the factions of Christianity and of the Jewish world have followed this precept, but those who did tre tremendously blessed this world we live in. Three times the word shalom, the word peace is in this verse. Peace in this world comes when we contribute to it and when we pray the Lord for its peace. And how much more the believer today since we are sealed by the Spirit of God, meaning that wherever we go, we sanctify the place where we, where we go. And one thing is clear is that the believer is not called to segregate himself completely from this world. Not to go and live in a monastery or in a community away from where the Lord had put, had put them. As Yeshua said in Matthew 5, 13 to 16, he says, you are the salt, the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under foot by men. You are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket or on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. This is our mandate. If we go out and segregate ourselves, how can we show our light and how can they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? You know, this, is, this passage is an extension of what we read in Jeremiah 29. Here we can see the great impact we can have on this world to bless it and to bring peace of God wherever we might be. Strictly speaking, salt cannot lose its saltiness. Sodium chloride is a stable compound. So what did Jesus meant when we read that the salt loses its flavor? Loses its flavor is actually one word in Greek. It literally means become foolish. Perhaps the translator did not realize that salt cannot lose its saltiness, so they translated it as is. But its meaning is that when we do not use our position, our power as sons of God, as though they are co-heir with the Messiah to bless this world, the scripture says we are foolish and useless. As the branch of the vine tree is taken away to be burnt, so the story of our life here on earth will be burnt and will be for nothing if we do not use our God-given ability to bless our neighborhood, the world where we're in. And so we are here in this world to contribute to its prosperity. Yes, this world may be evil. Yes, the government may be corrupt and so on and on, but it has nothing to do with the commandments to shed light of God into this world. 
You know, we have a beautiful historical example on how one person sought and did bless the place he was taken captive and how the Lord blessed him and the place where he was as well. It is one person who also must have read God's letter we are reading today. It was the young man, Daniel. He was there in Babylon where the letter arrived, and I believe it had a tremendous impact in his life. In fact, if there is one person in history who may have had the right to be angry with God and to rebel against the Babylonian was this man, Daniel. Yet his behavior stands as one of the best examples of those who are away from home, just like we are today, and stick to their faith. The events of Daniel 1 come at a very rapid pace. There we see how fast God blesses those who have decided to follow him. Let me just bring you to Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. While in captivity, we read that in verse 8. It says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies. That, I want to tell you, was a great decision. It was forbidden by the Mosaic law, by the law of God, to eat such meat as he was offered. And Daniel decided not to eat it, so he was in great danger of death. He was in great danger of offending his captors. It did not matter that the temple was being destroyed. It mattered not that he was in captivity. Daniel's faith was above this thing, and he knew well his God. That, it seems, touched God's heart so much that right away he came to the rescue. See the next verse, 9. God did not wait. And so he says, Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chiefs of the eunuchs. He made Daniel stand out of the crowd of his captors. And his captors, that is, begin to love him. They could not be offended by his action because God put love in their hearts for Daniel. Just like when Paul also, if you remember, was brought to Rome captive, the soldiers, the soldier that, is, that was responsible for him began to appreciate him and to highly respect him. This is what God does if we follow his commandments. This is what we ought to do for the Lord to listen, to hear us. The history of Daniel is a history of one success after another because this man put God first until he became the prime minister of Babylon, right? In the perspective of the whole Bible, this, this is an irony, I just want to tell you. The prophet of God becomes prime minister of that city that typifies rebellion throughout the scriptures. I want to tell you, our God is a sovereign God. It is a captive who becomes so high ranked that his captors become subjected to him. The same thing happened with Joseph. Same thing happened with Mordechai. Same thing can happen to you too if you follow the precepts of the Word of God. However, these are only types of the Messiah who now is rejected but will come a time where every knee will bow to him. And the truth we are learning here, how we ought to behave under a foreign government, is a truth that is really enhanced in the New Testament. There we find a marked dichotomy. On the one hand, we are repeatedly told we do not belong here. And on the other hand, we're told to work and to bless this world. If you remember in Hebrews 11.3, we are told that we are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. In 1 Peter 2.11, we are told that we are sojourners here. That is, we have a temporary residence here on earth. In Philippians 3.20, we read that the believer's citizenship is where? Not here, in heaven. Even Paul, in his eagerness to be away from this world and at home with God, he says in Philippians chapter 1, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He always wanted to go. Yet, he worked so hard for this world. And there are at least three passages that speak of the same things that we read in Jeremiah 29. You have Romans 13 especially. You have also 1 Peter 2 and 1 Timothy 2. And similarly, apart from the Jews in Babylon, if they are any people, if there's any people who could find reasons to rebel against this world and its rulers are the believers who were under the Roman rules. Also, at that time, the situation was so severe that I doubt any of us here may experience such opposition. 
Yet, here the scriptures, we are looking at people who firmly believe and follow the command of God. Let me bring you to Romans 13. There I believe the Spirit of God really expands for us in a clear manner what we find in Jeremiah 29. Let me read to you verses 1 and 2. It says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. All authorities were given by God, and going against these authorities is the same as resisting the ordinances of God. Strong, isn't it? And notice that the chapter here begins abruptly, as if it was already a problem at that time. Again, these were believers in the history of the church that had a good reason to rebel against the government at the time of the writing of this letter. The Roman government was headed by a Caesar named Nero. He was, according to historians, evil, egoistic, and cruel. Paul himself designates him as a savage beast in 2 Timothy 4.17. Speaking of him, he says, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And while the Christians of the time of Paul were not so persecuted, the next generation were the most perse persecuted by this wicked government. How were these words then put in application for them. You know, the scriptures never spoke of rebelling against the government. On the contrary, it urges us to respect it and to pay our taxes. You know, I heard that some Christians do not pay their taxes because they say that the government is corrupt or abusive. But remember that Jesus himself was under a very abusive government, yet he paid his taxes. And he made it a point to tell us to pay our taxes as well. You know, when they challenged him about taxes, he asked that they show him a coin. Do you remember? In Matthew 22, 21, he asked them, what is in that coin? He, and then he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. It is a question of giving to the government what belongs to it, and taxes are his. This is a commandment from the Lord. What picture do you see in here, in that dollar bill? Actually, I never knew she also was the Queen of Canada. I thought of her as being the Queen of England. But these things have no value in heaven. Okay? Seek ye first the kingdom, and I will give you all these things. And we have to reap for things that are eternal. You know, however, even though we are pilgrims here on earth, called, and Satan is called the God of this world, every single thing in this world is still subject to the God of the Bible. It might appear as if God has ended the keys of the forces of evil, to the forces of evil. He did not. He is still the master of this world. We might not comprehend the whole thing, but in the meantime, we ought to obey. It all amounts to saying that while God does not tell his people to seek peace in the city. He tells us to seek peace of the city by working and praying for it. And the command is clear. We are to pray for our government. See again Jeremiah 29, 7. He said, And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. Are we praying for our government. That also, I want to tell you, is a commandment from the Lord. Do you know that based on this passage, in the synagogues, a prayer for the welfare of the government is recited during the morning service. And the prayer dates back to biblical times. It never stopped. It began right after the reading of Jeremiah's letter. We can see it in Ezra 6.10 where it is written that the Jews began to pray for them. They prayed for the life of the king and his sons. They respected that law. The Jewish remnant understood these things and put them into action. You know, there's a story in the Talmud that relates to Alexander the Great, who arrived in the land of Israel with his army. Fearing that he will destroy the temple, he was met at the gate 
of Jerusalem by one called Simon the Just, who is believed to be Simon, the Simon that we have in Luke 2.25, who held the baby Jesus. And so he asked the conqueror whether he would, and I quote, destroy the house wherein prayers are set for you and your kingdom, that it be never destroyed. And so he was so touched that prayers were said on his behalf that he did not destroy the temple. And prayer for the Babylonians was really a foretaste of the forgiveness of Yeshua who teaches love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, right? Matthew 5, 44. To, be, to pray for one's enemy, one will really show a great quality. To be able to do this is to have risen above all the mediocrity that stems from this earth and to come very close to God's way of thinking. He forgave his enemies. He forgave us. And so we ought to put on Christ and to be like him. And besides the governments, are we praying for our society? Are we praying for our neighborhood, for our city? You know, I heard of a church in the U.S., I believe in Philadelphia. Three times a year, the people of this church take, take what they call a prayer walk. They walk the streets of the city asking the Holy Spirit to guide their prayers. To, they stop at apartment buildings and pray for the salvation of the people that live there. They stop at schools and they pray for the teachers and the students. They stop at businesses to pray for their owners. They stop at the homes of believers to pray for their ministry in the city. There seems to be much power in this. It is like spreading rays of light in a world of darkness. I think this is what we called for. You know, that may remind us of a passage of 1 Kings 8. There are many, many similarities. This is what God told the Israelites as they went out to battle. It says, when you people go out to battle against their enemies, whatever you send them, and when they pray to the Lord towards the city which you have chosen and the temple which you have, have built for your name, then hear in heaven their prayer and the supplication and maintain their cause. And God did listen to them. But these Israelites were going to battle. Can this apply to us? Yes, we are in a spiritual battle. There's a spiritual battle going on. Whether we see it or not, there is one that is constantly raging. We have already seen in Ephesians chapter 6, 12. It says, for we do not wrestle, wrestle that is against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. What are these four things that are mentioned? Right? You have the powers, principalities, rulers of darkness. These are demons organizations. We are in a battlefield, and we often forget that we are in one. And what is our weapon against them? Prayer. Prayer is our weapon. You know, I would love to try this type of prayers for a congregation in the near future so we can get out in the streets of Montreal to pray for the shalom of our neighborhood. Now that we have spoken about obeying our government, what then do you do when the government goes against the word of God? We need to deal with this, right? Where do we draw the line? The point is that as long as the civil law does not command us or ask us to do anything which goes contrary to the scriptures, we should obey. If the civil government passes a law which in no way violates scriptures, we are to obey it whether we like it or not. This is proper subjection to human government. But there is also an proper subjection. While there are many examples in the Bible of men and women who prayed and served the government, there are also many examples where the believers had to make a choice between God and men. Let me bring to you four circumstances where God clearly approved of believers' disobedience of a wicked law. When the government does not allow worship of God, worship is a freedom no one should attempt to remove. To Pharaoh, God told them in Exodus 5, let my people go that they may hold a feast, that they may worship me. He did not. And God dethroned them. Second, when the government commands believers to do immoral things such as killing innocent lives. In Exodus 1, the same Pharaoh asked the Jewish midwives to kill the babies, baby boys. They did not 
no matter what the cost. God bless them. When the Nazi government in Germany passed resolution that Jews should be exterminated, no German Christian should have obeyed that law. Only a few did. Third, when it commands believers to worship idols or to pray to a man, worship should be given only to God. Mordechai and Daniel's three friends, if you remember, risked their lives because they didn't want to worship anything or anybody but God. In the tribulation times, the believers will be asked to worship a man, the Antichrist, and to put his number 666 on them. They will refuse, and they will be enjoying great blessings for eternity. And finally, when the government forbids believers to propagate the Gospels. This is a sensitive issue, and it needs to be handled with wisdom. First, we are here for the purpose of glorifying God and to preach the Gospel, and it should not be taken away from us. Today, this freedom is taken away in many Muslim countries, for example. However, by the grace of God, many Muslims are coming to believe, whether it's by dreams or by the internet and so on. It will be a freedom that will be taken away from the believers in the tribulation. Yet, if you remember when we studied Revelation, we see that many thousands and thousands of people will come to a saving knowledge. And in Acts 19, when some of these people asked John and Peter not to preach the gospel, what did they say? Whether it is right in your sight, in the sight of God, to listen to you more than to God, you judge. We are to help and be obedient to the government we live under. However, when it goes against the word of God, we are to use much wisdom and prayer to know how to stand up to it. By the way, how long did God say that the Israelites were to stay in captivity? 70 years, right? This is what you find in verse 10, Jeremiah 29, 10. It says, what thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and so on and he will bring them back. 70 years, how long is this? Do you know that this is actually a lifetime? This is why I believe this passage speaks to us as he spoke to the believers at the time of Jeremiah. 70 years is the duration of a lifetime. However, if you have a good physician and take the proper medication, you can go to 80 years and more. This is what Moses said. Not about the physician, but about the 70 and 80 years. This is what we find in Psalm 90.10, if you remember that verse. It says, the days of our lives are 70 years. If by reason of strength, they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. As the Israelites were in Babylon, so... We also are somehow in captivities, captivity, and we are waiting for our 70 years to elapse. While we are here, we are definitely, definitely called to do the work and to abide by the laws here. It's only in following these things that we can have a great impact on this world. You know, the people of this world have to see us as a group of people that want the best for them. They should not see us as rebels or outlaws but as those who want to share the love of God with them. This is the light we should not put under the bushel. And after all, 70 years, I want to tell you, is a very short time. And I love the way Moses speaks of death in this verse. He says that we will fly away. You know, I understand Moses using these words. He had such a hard time in the wilderness with the people of Israel. He, was probably, he probably dreamt of flying away. However, this is one word in the Hebrew that not only means flying away, you know what it means also? It's the same word for eyelid. To show how swift it will be. Does that remind you of something in the New Testament? We almost sang it. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, same word, right? In the twinkling of an eye, in the blink of an eyelid. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised and corruptible and we shall be changed. Both the Greek and the Hebrew here are basically the same word. And whichever comes first, the rapture or the death, it will be fast. We will be with the Lord right away. And Paul adds, by the way, here in 1 Corinthians 15, a new and unknown information to Moses. That is the possibility of being taken away instead of dying. Because the rapture in the New Testament is a mystery as we see it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the blessed hope, as it is in Re uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. At the end of it, 
He said to give you a future and a hope. This is the blessed hope of a time to come. So our hope is the eminent coming of our Lord to take us with him, whether we fly away or at the rapture, that is, or at death. You know, in his classic devotional book titled The Saints Everlasting Rest, English Puritan pastor and author Richard Baxter wrote back in the 1600s. I want to read you what he wrote. He says, why are, we not, why are not our hearts continually set on heaven? Why dwell we not there in constant contemplation? Bent your soul to study eternity. Busy yourself about the life to come. Habituate yourself to such contemplation and let not those thoughts be seldom or cursory, but bath yourself in heaven's delight. You know, this man was a Puritan, and these Puritans were the Americans' first pilgrims and did contribute to the success of North America as we know it today because they were hard workers. They believed in a well-ordered society and believed in a government that would guide and protect all citizens. They were instrumental in the building the American society and democracy we're enjoying today, yet... They also had the desire to be in heaven. You see the dichotomy here? You can have both. You can have both desires for here and for heaven. This desire to be in heaven and at the same time have a strong desire to work and bless this world is seen also in the man in the scriptures. For example, again, we can bring back Hebrews 11. 11, 16, he says, but now they desire better, that is a heavenly country. But these are the people, actually, that influenced the word. It is through them that we have the word of God. It is through them that we have all the blessings that we have in our scriptures. Yet, they desire a better country. We can have both. We can work and have this great desire. You know, I remember reading about an American tourist who visited the 19th century Polish rabbi, Hofetz Chaim. He was astonished to see that the rabbi's home was only a simple room filled with books, plus a table and a bench. So the tourist asked, Rabbi, where's your furniture? Where's yours? The rabbi says. Mine? Asked the puzzle. I'm here and visitor, you know, I'm, I'm only passing through. So he says, so am I. <laughs> you know, the Jews also have this yearning. In fact, the great majority of those mentioned in Hebrews 11 were Jews, right? So today, their desire is based on a new world to come. Our desire it might be different because we belong to the church. It is on the new Jerusalem that is above. And before we go on, on this subject and close, there's something that is said about these false prophets, those who were in Babylon and those that remained, remained in Jerusalem. What we find in this section is that many of them are named, Right? Here they are not, no more the false prophets as a group. They are people whose names and family names are given. We read of Shemaiah. His name is mentioned five times in, Jerus in Jeremiah, that is. Shemaiah the Henelamit. That's Jeremiah 29.32. There's the priest, prophet Hananiah, the son of Azur, who was from Gibeon in Jeremiah 28.1. He's mentioned 11 times in Jeremiah. We also read of Ahab, the son of Koliah, and Zedekiah, the son of Masi, in Jeremiah 29, 21, for example. Do you think we should mention names of false teachers and false prophets who come today? I want to tell you the writers of the New Testament were not shy. John mentions a man, Diotrephus, who says that the love to have a preeminence among the people. Paul mentions also a few. But if these people are not named, how would you know? that they are not from God before they bite you. Many say that this is character assassination, but the Bible is clear on this point. If someone teaches things that are not in the scriptures, this someone should be made even more public so that the believers will be protected and not misled. This is what we learn from Jeremiah. And here again, we are told how to recognize a false prophet. You have it in 28.9. Jeremiah 28, 9, he says, As the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. This is the very same thing, if you remember, that we find in Deuteronomy 18. When a prophet gives a prophecy, if it doesn't come about, 
then it is not from God. Look at the last words here. You shall not be afraid of him. It really means you shall have no fellowship with him in the Hebrew. You know, in Jeremiah, the judgment came very quickly in accordance with Deuteronomy 18.20. Jeremiah indicated that Hananiah's death would happen that year. This is why Jeremiah took special care to state the exact month in verse 1 of chapter 28. And in verse 17, he says that in the seventh month, less than two months after Jeremiah's prediction occurred. Today, it does not happen that quickly, but thank God we have the word of God to judge these matters. And this is where we come to one of the most evangelical verse, or most evangelical verses in the Old Testament. Last week, we closed with these verses. This week, we will do the same. Let's read again, Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. And God says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. This is really, I want to tell you, a gem of a passage. And what is the conclusion reached in verse 12? Then you will call upon me. Uh, how can people call upon God? What does the Bible say? in the whole frame of the scriptures. Today, how can the people really call upon God if by nature we are not prone to seek God? How would they call upon God if you don't tell them, right? This is what the Bible says, Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how should they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And the word preacher here is not a professional preacher, it's you. It is you who proclaimed the word, who proclaimed the word and proclaimed your salvation, Yeshua. If there's one person that understood the importance of speaking the word to others, it's Paul. He started this letter in Romans, in Romans 1.14. He says, I'm a debtor to both Gentiles and barbarians, both to wise and unwise. Debtors, that means we, he owed it to them, so we owe them also to tell them because salvation was by grace we are not to sit down and just be content to go to heaven and forfeit the work we are called to do and it was the same person paul who said in first corinthians 9 16 warn to me if i do not preach the gospel we are i want to tell you very much partners with god to bring the people to a saving knowledge so what we learned from the israelites of the time is that God was always with them, walking along with them, as he is with every believer. Even though the circumstances may indicate otherwise, even though we don't always feel his presence, he is surely with us. You know, I will close with a story I read. It is about a little boy who was harassed by a bully. Every day he went to school, and the bully would beat him up. Some of his friends were telling him what to do. They gave him a lot of different advice. They told him to try another route home, but the bully found out about that route and still beat him up. Another person suggested that the little boy carry a stick. He carried the stick, the bully caught him with the stick and beat him up with the stick. One day he was walking to school terrified, out jumped the bully with his fist, clenched and getting ready to pound on the boy. The youngster beckoned to the bully and said, come on, I'm ready. The bully couldn't believe this young man, how he got so much guts. He says, come on, come on, you bully, and I'll take you right now. Aggravated, the bully started toward the boy, intending to beat him. All of a sudden, out steps the boy's father from behind the bush. He was six foot ten and 275 pounds. The bully looked up in shock and said, oh no. See, the closer you are with your father, the closer you are with your daddy, the more the bully called the devil will have to leave you alone. If your daddy is staying home because you don't want to be close to him, don't be surprised if the devil wears you out day in and day out. Let's bow our head in prayer. Almighty God, we ask you this, that you might make us to be not only your worshipers, 
but your witnesses. Kindle the fire in our bones, loosen our lips, bring us to realize our own spiritual gifts that you have given us at your conversion and fill us with your spirit and make us your witnesses. In this congregation, Lord, may there be men and women, boys and girls, who at this moment may be far from you and perhaps in concern of the souls of others. May you touch them and revive in them a thirst and hunger for your words and a great zeal to perform your work. We are grateful for your presence and for your constant protection. May we be worthy to carry the great news of the gospel to the unsaved. We pray in the name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. May the Lord bless you all. To get in touch with us, you can do so by telephone 1-888-685-5902. Locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. You can also reach us through our website at www.arielcanada.com. Again, the phone number is 1-888-685-5902. Or locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. 5902. Website address is W Ariel Canada, all one word, A R I E L Canada.com. Be blessed. Shalom.